last month when they did it. Greetings to all of you, our audience, wherever you are. We would like to greet you from the Dead Sea in Jordan, where the World Economic Forum for the Middle East and North Africa is being held. Our day's session is going to focus on female issues, and we will be asking questions about the situation of women in the Arab world and the challenges that women confront to enter the market, the job market, particularly when it comes to both public and private sectors. Today, we will be asking several questions related to the challenges challenges that Arab women face uh, from the Gulf to the ocean, uh, all throughout the Arab uh, world and Arab countries. And it is our pleasure to host various uh, panelists whose uh, cause, is, primary cause, is to uphold the case of women. So let us welcome Her Excellency, Minister of Social Development of Jordan, Reem Abu Hassan, uh, her Mm, Royal Highness Amira Al Tawil from Saudi Arabia and Khalid Al Khudair uh, and uh, Imad bin Musa. Uh, let's start off with the Minister uh, Reem Abu Hassan. Uh, as I have uh, mentioned, today we will be talking about uh, the situation of women in the Arab world, particularly in uh, the public and private sectors. When it comes to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, what is the situation or status of women at present day? particularly in the public sector, since you present the <coughs> ministry. In the name of God, uh, I would like to welcome all the uh, guests to Jordan. As far as uh, the situation of women in Jordan is concerned, I like to start off uh, by talking about the legal uh, framework, framework or context, whether we're talking about the international or domestic frameworks. The right of women uh, is preserved uh, under uh, treatments and conventions that, that were signed by uh, the by Jordan uh, uh, conventions with the ILO and human rights conventions as well as in the constitution of Jordan that has maintained and safeguarded the right of work for all men and women after the age of 16 uh, job equality and equality, gender equality in the assumption of public positions are both uh, safeguarded in the Constitution. However, this legal context does not uh, necessarily mean that it is translated uh, um, entirely in reality. The, the women participation, economic participation of women is only 14 percent. And I have to admit that is one of the lowest uh, economic participation, gender participation in the world. Uh, there are various uh, challenges uh, standing ahead of us, and that and those uh, challenges uh, have uh, led in the past and might continue to lead to this uh, low level of uh, participation. Uh, one of those uh, challenges is the social uh, uh, beliefs. Furthermore, uh, women have assumed uh, roles uh, throughout the, all the walks of life, uh, whether it is the executive, uh, for example, you can see that there is only one, uh, it is true that there is only one minister in the executive uh, in this current uh, cabinet, but there have always uh, been uh, uh, women uh, assuming uh, public positions. When it comes to the legislative, we have 19 MPs out of 150 MPs. And I think we have seven senates out of uh, 50 uh, uh, senators. Uh, in the judiciary, the percentage of uh, female uh, participation is 10 percent. Of course, we are looking forward to increasing these percentages, because uh, having one minister, female minister or one minister, does not mean that uh, economic participation of women has increased. Uh, we want women to assume decision-making positions, particularly when it comes in the middle uh, management. Uh, then we will be able to say that uh, women have assumed uh, the role uh, on uh, the uh, hierarchy of uh, positions that would enable her to participate in the decision-making process and to uh, combat uh, the uh, prototype uh, or uh, uh, typical ideas against women in the society. When it comes uh, to women uh, participation in the uh, public sector, Your Excellency, the Minister, you have uh, mentioned uh, some modest participation. Let's turn on uh, to Her Excellency Amira Al-Tawir, uh, Her 
Highness, sorry, uh, you are uh, the owner of Al Waqt Foundation uh, that is uh, interested uh, of uh, developing uh, female or women participation, and you are the board member uh, of uh, uh, an initiative by uh, Sheikh Hamouza to create uh, more positions uh, for women uh, uh, in the Silatec. Uh, so you are interested in uh, increasing uh, women participation in Saudi Arabia. What do you think uh, of uh, what you have heard? You have heard uh, the, about the position in Jordan. What do you think of the position of Saudi women uh, when it comes to the assumption of high-ranking positions in the public sector or in the private sector, since you manage a private uh, company or corporation, uh, time agency? Uh, in the name of God, yes, uh, the situation of women in Saudi Arabia has developed over the last uh, two years, uh, given the uh, various uh, decisions that were adopted in the executive, her participation in the economy has uh, risen. But uh, the unemployment rate is 12 percent, and 85 per, uh, percent of that 12 percent is uh, uh, composed by women. Uh, the Ministry of Labor has uh, laid out uh, around 12 programs to develop uh, the role of women in the workplace. And uh, those uh, programs have enabled us to employ more than 160,000 uh, Saudi women in 2012. However, the most daunting challenge is uh, uh, not only the legislation, but it is the concept, the mentality. Because we know that our, tradition, our society is very conservative and is very private. And it is very difficult to change concepts in Saudi Arabia to support uh, women in their work place, uh, place or her a larger uh, contribution. And uh, this usually happens because of the internet and uh, studying abroad. And indeed, there are legislations uh, that are supporting women, but it is a matter of time. Many conservative men would uh, say that we don't want uh, women to work. We want to maintain her uh, dignity. That is not true. They are not maintaining her dignity while uh, when they prohibit her from working. There are many program works uh, that, uh, or program of work that allow women to work in various uh, fields uh, that would uh, maintain her dignity. So <laughs> I think uh, the main reason is fear from women and not for women, because they are afraid of women. And we know that women are stronger than men in our society, in our world, because they are a minority. And the minority usually want, uh, wants to prove itself. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, not every single woman has to work, but any woman who wants to work should be able to work. Thank you. That was a very clear message. Uh, so now we know that women are competing uh, with men in Saudi Arabia. And let's uh, remain with Saudi Arabia and turn to Khalid al Khudair, uh, who is uh, a very uh, vehement uh, supporter of women's rights, particularly when in, in Saudi Arabia. He has uh, three uh, high uh, degrees from Canada. And uh, you have uh, been the founder of Glow Work uh, in order to create uh, uh, job opportunities for women in Saudi Arabia, sir. In your view, how is the situation now in uh, Saudi Arabia in terms of employment of women? Is there uh, an opening up for women in the job uh, market? Uh, has the mentality changed in Saudi Arabia? In the name of God, uh, let me tell you my story, how I started off uh, my uh, career in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, as soon as I came back from Canada, having finished my BA and having uh, um, graduated uh, in three degrees, uh, human resources, uh, marketing, and uh, commerce or trading, I was taken by surprise uh, when I found out that I would not be able to find a, a, an employment if I did not know the job market and I did not know corporations. And that affected me personally. So I knew that I had to work on my information and on my knowledge. And uh, But at the same time, I knew that I had to work through connections and contacts, what we call wasta in Arabic. And uh, I was able to assume a position because of this wasta. My sister, three years after I graduated from Canada, 
graduated from Canada and she came to Riyadh. I told her, I have a job for you and I hope that you'll be able to work with me within one week. She told me, I'm more dignified than you. I will not allow for anyone else to give me a position because of Wasta or connections. And she waited for seven, seven months uh, in uh, looking for a job. Uh, and of course, uh, she was not able to go and drive on her own. Uh, she would uh, need to go uh, uh, through uh, with a driver and we had this segregation uh, situation where uh, offices were segregated for men and women and uh, she would uh, submit her uh, CV to the security office and that uh, CV would not even come to the human resources office and then I wanted to find out what were the problems I as a young man had problems in finding a job or seeking a job how about women two or three years ago we did not have any statistics about uh, women employment or even youth employment uh, or the rate of unemployment, etc. The Ministry of Labor, under an initiative uh, or uh, rather a, um, a decree uh, from uh, the king about a program called uh, Incentive, uh, which is a salary, one month salary for job seekers. Uh, and I thought that that program, Hafiz, uh, was just uh, throwing uh, money down the drain uh, to cover up the problem. However, maybe there is a story that should be told. The Ministry of Labor has created that program in order to collect uh, uh, statistics. Now we have a data database uh, with various women, 1,600,000 uh, unemployed uh, persons in Jordan from uh, in, in Saudi Arabia from the years 20 to 45, uh, and 40% of them are holders of ba BAs or bachelor degrees. And uh, the Ministry of Labor has uh, thus uh, in, uh, drafted uh, new legislation uh, such as uh, women in the uh, retail uh, um, sector, and that would create more jobs in the coming three years. Uh, uh, the minister has also set up uh, a guidance council uh, uh, for women participation in uh, partnership with the private sector and is about to launch uh, uh, guidelines for women's participation in the job market, which would uh, facilitate things for uh, women to find uh, and for corporations uh, to create uh, opportunities for uh, more uh, women participation in the job market. Some of the new legislations uh, about uh, women work uh, dictate or stipulate for uh, the fact that uh, corporations are obliged uh, to employ a certain percentage uh, of uh, women or to have uh, certain sectors uh, entirely composed of women, such as the front office of the retail business, of the retail business which is 100% uh, women, as well as uh, um, shops with the women uh, supplies uh, and make up uh, products. And in the coming uh, three months, uh, the accessories uh, shops uh, and even the jewelry shops uh, are going to give uh, more uh, female uh, representation, not only in the front office, but also in uh, decision uh, or leadership uh, positions of such uh, shops uh, and such uh, corporations. That was a very long uh, path that was taken uh, by uh, the ministry. Mr. Khaled, do you believe that these uh, laws that were um, passed in Saudi Arabia would uh, be able to uh, push uh, for uh, more representation of women within corporations, or do we need uh, to change mentalities before we draft laws? Uh, yes, we need to work on changing mentalities, um, and uh, this is something very, very important for us to uh, support support uh, women uh, participation in the private sector. Uh, following graduation, uh, women think of working uh, as uh, teachers in the education or in the public sector. And in the private sector, what we are trying to do in the ministry is to make the private sector more conducive to uh, female uh, or to women uh, uh, participation. In the past, 20%, uh, uh, sorry, 2% was only the percentage that was uh, assorted uh, to women participation uh, and to Saudization percentage, which is to turn jobs to Saudis rather than to foreigners. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, we found that uh, all this is related to education. Uh, uh, because we are brought up in Saudi Arabia and in uh, some other Arab countries, uh, believing for 20 or 24 
two years believing that uh, we are managers, managers of our drivers and our uh, housemaids, and we believe that we will be managers even in the job market. Uh, so the expectations are very high for uh, some of our uh, young people. There is a gap between education and uh, real uh, uh, job opportunities. Uh, Miss the moderator, yes, there is such a gap, and we will talk about it later on in order to talk about certain initiatives when it comes to the private sector or the public sector and uh, um, NGOs. Uh, but before that, uh, let me turn to uh, Mr. Imad uh, bin Musa, who comes uh, from uh, uh, Dubai, but he is originally Moroccan, and he is uh, the Director General of Coca-Cola Middle East, uh, and he's been there for 14 uh, years. Uh, you have started off, sir, uh, in uh, marketing in one of the world's largest uh, uh, companies in the world, but you have started off in Morocco. Now you are the general manager of Coca-Cola in uh, the um, Middle East, uh, Coca-Cola Middle East region. In your view, what is the difference between the situation of women in North Africa and their challenges uh, and uh, the situation of women in the Middle East, particularly in the Gulf countries. The situation of women uh, across the Middle East and North Africa is gradually improving. Uh, women are challenging the status quo. Uh, they're demanding equality. Uh, and they're calling for women empowerment, not only economically, but also politically and socially. I think it's important. Uh, th there is a, an undeniable fact that the cost of living is rising. And that is putting more pressure on household to diversify revenues. So uh, a revenue stream of one family member is not enough to keep up with the growth and to keep up with the needs that families have. And hence, the role of the female member of the family is going to increase and it's going to put more pressure on the society. And that's just something that we've seen in the Western world 30 and 40 years ago. Uh, I think the educational attainment in Middle East and North Africa is also improving. Uh, we see more and more uh, women into the job market. The, the ratio, however, of women in the labor force, as, as was mentioned by Maadi Wazira, is very low. Uh, the, I think the average across Middle East and North Africa is around 20%. Now, that average is slightly higher when it comes to Morocco or Tunisia uh, and Turkey, but it's also very high, for instance, in Indonesia, which is another Muslim country on the Asian continent, which is 38%. So that, that gives us a little bit of a benchmark. Um, I think according to the WEF gender gap report that was issued two years ago, the, 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 the gender gap is narrowing. Uh, if we look at, for instance, uh, the UAE, the literacy rate uh, among women is higher than uh, what it is among men. Uh, we've also seen some very bold and uh, progressive moves. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, the vice president of the UAE and, and, and the ruler of Dubai, uh, made a decision to make it mandatory for uh, women to be represented in the board of directors of uh, uh, local uh, government entities in the, in the Dubai uh, Emirates. Uh, and the other point that I would like to say also, I think it was mentioned by Khalid, is the, the college enrollment of women has made fantastic progress over the last 20 years. And there's an interesting statistic that shows that actually it does not necessarily relate to the economic development of a country. In fact, college enrollment for women is uh, the same in the US as it is in China or in Brazil. It's around 57, 58%. What that say is there is a massive influx of talents coming into the, into, the, into the market, and the private sector, as well as government and NGOs, have a, a fantastic opportunity to really tap into this talent pool that, that is existing. I mean, if you drive around Riyadh, uh, you, you see, for instance, Nura University, which is a, a fantastic facility, state-of-the-art technology. Tens of thousands of Saudi women, uh, talented future leaders, certainly, will be there for the market. And it's for us, as a private sector and, 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 and government, to really tap into that opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Ahmad bin Musa. And here we uh, end the first part of our discussions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ahmad bin Musa. Uh, your uh, Royal Highness, uh, the Princess, uh, Your Excellency, the Minister, and Mr. Khalid, uh, thank you for uh, 
uh, following uh, uh, this first part of this program that's coming from the Dead Sea, where the World Economic Forum is being held for the Middle East and North Africa, we stop for a few moments, and then we resume our discussion in its second part. D'accord, très bien. إذا سنتوقف ربما لثلاثين ثانية لمتابعة هذا النقاش في الجزء الثاني لمدة خمس وعشرين دقيقة وبعدها Uh, we greet you again, uh, the uh, audience of uh, France 24, and uh, now we are in the second part of the discussion about the status of women in the Arab world, uh, it's, uh, the reality and the challenges they face in access uh, to the labor market and to senior positions in uh, public institutions. Uh, your Excellency Princess Amira Tawil, as we mentioned at the beginning, you are fully informed about the situation and the status of women in the uh, Saudi Arabia. However, what are the solutions and the initiatives taken by women themselves inside Saudi Arabia in order to advance uh, the status of women, particularly in the economic sector and the private sector? The Saudi women in general are leaders by their nature. We always find them keen to work. We have women in the business sector and also women work in uh, uh, managing funds uh, and in education and the health sector. We find women in all these sectors. And now you can see women in politics and in the legal sector. So there is a lot of progress for Saudi women. However, uh, commenting on what uh, Mr. Khaled said, uh, the problem is that there is no relation between education and uh, the uh, labor market. Uh, so you find that 70 percent want to work in uh, education, while 40 percent want to work in the public sector. Only 6 percent want to work in the information uh, technology, and only 10 percent in the financial sector. As a country, other than oil, we rely on IT and the finance. Unfortunately, the educational system must teach entrepreneurship, and they must inform the students about the positive aspects and negative aspects of sectors, what are the needs of our country, where the good jobs lie. So there's a need to orient and direct students 
and job seekers so that their expectations would meet and would be commensurate with the uh, mar uh, labor market needs. I see this is a huge gap. However, women are uh, pioneers, and the government has proposed solutions. But I don't expect that there's a prob this is a problem only in Saudi Arabia, but all over the Arab world. There is a concept that uh, men should work and be the uh, breadwinners, and women should stay at home and care for the children. If you want to demand real equality, then women must contribute to build the society equally with men if they really want real equality, just like uh, the societies in the West. So women should not only care for uh, their homes and their children, but also they should contribute to building their societies and their countries. And this is important for us. Such uh, concepts should change. In your opinion, the main reason uh, lies in uh, the gap between education and the labor market. Uh, this is at the public uh, sector level. But as a private sector, what are the initiatives you uh, take in order to change uh, this uh, male uh, perception? There is a simple uh, uh, word in English, being there. We are there. We manage our companies and we manage our uh, money. Uh, we do not rely on anyone else. Uh, we are self-reliant. Saudi women are uh, present, and we hope that they will assume even more senior positions. But do you believe that enacting laws and governmental decisions alone are capable of changing this uh, stereotype about women, whether in the Saudi Arabia or in other Arab countries? What, what is the role of the civil society and the uh, non-governmental organizations? Everything starts by laws, whether the uh, beliefs change or not. Unless there are laws that are supportive of women, then these concepts and beliefs will not change. So we see that these laws are changing, especially after the Arab Spring. They are changing all over the Arab world, and there are new laws being introduced. More importantly, there is more openness at the level of knowledge and economics and the, uh, the strength and the presence of women. Arab women are uh, present and strong. However, the society must be more supportive of women, not only by financing or uh, through laws, but also by accepting her socially and accepting her role in uh, uh, labor. So this might be a difficulty that uh, you face in defending women in uh, Saudi Arabia. Your Excellency Minister Reem Abu Hassan, you mentioned a very important point when you spoke about uh, this uh, uh, timid uh, participation of women uh, uh, in the uh, labor market, and uh, even in the public sector in Jordan and in other Arab countries. The presence of women inside the uh, governmental departments is very uh, modest. Uh, for example, in Morocco, there's one minister. Uh, in Tunisia, there are two women ministers. What are the obstacles and problems that you face now as a woman leading a ministry at the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan in order to take initiatives and implement them on the ground? Uh, thank you. First, I wish to comment on uh, what uh, Her uh, Excellent, uh, Her uh, Royal Highness, uh, the Princess, said about the gap between the labor market and education. This is a challenge that all Arab countries are facing, and I don't want to elaborate any further. However, regarding Jordan, as we speak about a level of education that is very high for women, this is no more a challenge. But. As uh, Her Royal Highness uh, also uh, spoke about laws, laws are important, but they are not sufficient. Even if the uh, law speaks about the right of women to work, there are other issues related to, to work of women, including the role of the uh, Jordanian state in putting a system for the maternity fund in Jordan. Women participate in the household income, and it is a main income. Therefore, there's an obligation by the state to help women in having a maternity leave so that she would not be an obstacle and a cause for discriminating against her in employment. And also, related day to daycare centers, the uh, law is there, but it requires uh, mechanisms for implementation. And now Jordan is working on establishing daycare centers in the public sector before the private sector in order to enable women in uh, raising their children. 
uh, when a woman is working uh, while she's married, this is a reality that cannot be reversed. The issue is about uh, developing mechanisms that would help her to, uh, to implement her role as a mother and as well as her role as a productive citizen. The third point is about the right to work. Uh, it, it is there. However, there is a wage gap. There is no equal pay. And this is something that was uh, considered in Jordan. And a study was conducted. And it turned out that women require to work at an additional 64 days in order to get equal pay for the equal work. And this is something that must be addressed by law first, and then through uh, implementation mechanisms. The last point is related to policies about uh, harassment in the workplace. This is an important issue. Some may say that the reason for harassment is the access of women to the labor market. Uh, this, is, uh, this, this problem exists, and it has to be addressed uh, through the uh, penalties and the labor law, and also even regulations or the bylaws of companies. Another challenge is the right of women in the family laws. This has a direct impact on uh, the ability of women to work and her access to decision-making positions. If we want women to be productive and to access uh, leading positions, then there's a need to guarantee her rights inside the family, which means that her right uh, in inheritance, which is her uh, a right that is guaranteed in the Holy Quran, but there are uh, 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 women are being forced uh, to uh, give up their rights and inheritance. And in this regard, uh, the uh, Jordan uh, uh, interfered so that women do not give up their property uh, that ha uh, uh, she had inherited from her father or from her family through intimid social intimidation. The rate of women who own lands in Jordan does not ex do exist for, uh, does not exceed 4%. And we want uh, to increase this rate because often uh, owning land is the mean to get a loan uh, and to use it as collateral for uh, financing investments. When we speak about women, we also speak about persons with special needs. We should not speak about women only who are capable to work, but when we look for the presence of women, we also need to consider the persons with special needs and how we can activate the role of women, whether disabled women or uh, other women in the labor market. Uh, Dear Excellency, uh, the Arab countries have uh, witnessed the Arab Spring, and some uh, countries uh, continue to uh, live through this period. To what extent uh, have these uh, revolts and this commotion, uh, to what extent has it contributed to the advancing the role of women and advocating their rights in general? Do you believe that the mentality has changed? Uh, did the Arab countries succeed in giving more rights to women, or have, uh, ha has her status deteriorated? I'm not speaking particularly about Jordan, but in general about Arab countries. I believe that the Arab Spring is a double-edged sword regarding women. On one hand, the role of uh, women as a citizen and part of the people, and the importance of uh, her uh, popular participation in decision making is very important. Uh, but hence the importance of transparency and social justice. However, on the other hand, regarding uh, the issue of uh, the rights of women, what we are witnessing now are calls for uh, giving up achievements made by women throughout uh, in the past years. And now, many women movements are discussing a means of maintaining their achievements rather than moving forward. And I believe that this is a problem because women participation in the labor market or in politics, change is going to happen and uh, possibly for economic reasons. However, if the uh, women movement uh, uh, would be, uh, would suffice to maintain its achievements rather than moving forward, then this 
means we are not going to achieve what we want to achieve. Mr. Imbad bin Musa, uh, you have uh, listened to what uh, 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 the minister has said and Her uh, Royal Highness, uh, the uh, uh, princess has said about the obstacles. As a director general of uh, one of the largest uh, companies in the world, there are initiatives definitely to advance women and to defend their rights and for uh, gender equality in the workplace. What are the most important difficulties you face in such initiatives, particularly in the Middle East? I think large corporations and uh, private sector in general has a leading role to play. Uh, and uh, we all, as, as large corporations, need to lead by example. We, we have a very ambitious vision for the Coca-Cola company to double our, double our business by 2020. Uh, and one of the three priorities and on the people side is to develop and advance women in leadership position. Uh, our 2020 vision is supported by a very firm belief that women will play a transformative role uh, in shaping the global economy. There is no doubt about that. Uh, we have a global women initiative that we launched five years ago. Uh, I would like to share with you some facts. 40% uh, of the global workforce is women, and it's increasing, 40%. 50% of the 7 billion people of this, on this earth are women. Now, that's not new news, but that, that also means 50% of our consumers as a consumer product company are, are women. Uh, every household product that gets into the house, be it on the food, on the beverage, on the beauty care, household care, health care, is actually purchased by a woman or largely influenced by women. 70% of those household products that get into the house are influenced by women. And that's, that's a very important insight for us to keep in mind. So the conclusion is not only it is the right course of action, morally speaking, but it also makes social and economic sense yes. for our business, not only to reach those consumers and customers, but also to tap into the talent pool that we discussed earlier today. Uh, the other element internally, the initiative that we're doing is, is the Global Women Initiative, uh, inspired by our chairman, Mr. Murtar Kant. Uh, we've put a, a council of 17 very talented uh, women executives of the company. Uh, and basically that share the same passion with, uh, with, with our company and our chairman. And basically they've been tasked to develop recommendations in order to advance uh, women uh, in, in the leadership position. Now, what does, mean, what does that mean is the focus should be around recruitment, retention, and retention is, is, is a big challenge for us, especially when it comes to women recruitment, as well as development and advancement. You can only retain good talents being a man or woman if there is a clear career path. And that will lead into a leadership position. Uh, I would like to share with you some metrics. You know, we like to say Coca-Cola, but we only measure, we only manage what we measure. So measurement is important. Uh, pipeline representation of women went from 28% to 34% globally in the last five years. Uh, the next pipeline of leaders is now at 46%. 46% of our workforce in the next pipeline are women. So very, very close to the gender parity. Uh, similar to this panel where we have two, two men and two women. Um, female representation in key assessment and development programs went from 21 in 2007 to 49% last year. So one associate out of two is women in terms of development program. And if we look at the external hiring, and we do work with Mr. Al Khudair in, in Saudi, uh, external hiring of senior levels uh, went from 13% in 2007 to 41% last year. So we tripled the external hiring of women globally within, uh, within the Coca-Cola company. So that, that's what we do internally in terms of advancing women leadership position. I do also want to share with you a very, uh, a very great, very interesting project that we started. I think it's one of the most ambitious ones. You, you might have heard about it in line with our Vision 2020 called 5 by 20. We have made a commitment publicly as a Coca-Cola company to empower 5 million women by 2020. Uh, and that's a very, very bold target that we've set ourselves. Uh, that means specifically that we would like to empower those women in small business around the supply chain of our company and, and our system. I think we discussed about that. There is a unique set of economic and social barriers. I think legal barriers can be broken, they can be, uh, uh, we, can, we, can, we can fix them, but the social barriers are, are, are the biggest hurdle I see within the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, barriers are like business skills, uh, social acceptance, leadership training programs, as simple as that, and access to financial assets and solutions. 
I think we sometimes underestimate that, that, that element. So there is no better investment uh, than women to support economic growth. Uh, I, I think that uh, if you look at the 5 band 20, since 2010 when we announced it, we've made good progress in India, the Philippines, and South Africa. Uh, very recently, we announced the expansion of that program into China, Mexico, Nigeria, Kenya, and Egypt. So we're expecting by the end of this year to empower 300,000 women. We still have a long way to go, but I think the progress we're making is, is very important. And the biggest challenge as we empower those women across the supply chain of the company is to make sure that we have the right balance. I e, want to make sure that we're developing the right programs and that have the right impact on the community, but also makes business sense that the company also get the yield from, from those programs because the ecosystem has to be sustained. The ecosystem has to, be, uh, has to work across the, across, the, uh, across the value chain. Now, the second element, which is, I think, more relevant to the Middle East and uh, North Africa region, is, is a partnership that we're very proud of, that the Coca-Cola company has signed with uh, UN Women. Uh, in 2011, it's a partnership over three years uh, with a budget of $4 million to empower more than 40,000 women in three countries. So this is our pilots, uh, Brazil, South Africa, and Egypt. Um, in South Africa, for instance, we're empowering women to uh, be involved in the uh, retailing business or so in the distribution of our brand. And I think as a Coca-Cola company, partnering with them will enable them to have a greater access to financial solutions, as well as developing training programs and leadership skills. Uh, in so in, uh, in uh, Brazil, we're working with farmers. 13,000 women will be in, uh, in the farming and, in the, uh, and in, the, uh, in the recycling business. And lately in Egypt, uh, 4,500 women uh, will be uh, basically uh, empowered through uh, small-scale distribution centers and kiosks. So if you see a couple of kiosks in Cairo very soon, no. one of those will be driven by this initiative that we've done with the Coca-Cola company and, and the UN Women. Since the Coca-Cola has a secret recipe, it seems that you also have a secret recipe for defending women uh, through such initiatives. Mr. Khaled al Khodir, you listened to uh, the interventions. In your opinion, uh, how do you see the future since you are a sincere advocate of women's rights and you have uh, experience in Saudi Arabia? How do you see the future? Are you optimistic? Do you see that the government policy and the civil society are capable in the few coming years to guarantee a good status for women, particularly in the Arab societies? I hope and I see a good future for uh, w w women in work, particularly in the Saudi Arabia. There is uh, interaction uh, by the private sector, and even women are uh, defending the, uh, w uh, the rights of women to work. In the future, as I expect, particularly for Saudi Arabia, we, I feel that it's going to be a benchmark for other states regarding uh, work of women, especially through the initiatives that the government and the private sector are taking. Investing in uh, women education and training and rehabilitation for the labor market will, and in such a short period of time, shall build a promising future. I will give you an example. We have around 15 universities that teach women in the kingdom. These universities did not have a, a co-op or internship programs for uh, uh, employment. Last year only, 80% of these universities have launched uh, rehabilitation and training programs, and they are mandatory for women in universities. This is something uh, that was lacking in the past. We have conducted a study uh, one month ago, and it turned out that 96% of the uh, female university students want to work. The future is promising, and I 
hope that you will hear good news about the kingdom uh, regarding uh, the labor market and women participation. And uh, I hope that uh, I will be alive uh, so that I'll see my sister and all our other sisters uh, part of the labor market. This is what we hope, uh, Your Excellency Minister uh, Abu Hassan. Uh, we have three more minutes uh, for uh, ending this discussion. In one minute, please, what is your, your message that you can address to Arab women in light of the, the current political and economic conditions in the region? Well, I would like to mention that uh, Her Royal Highness said that the women in Saudi Arabia are strong. I think that the women are strong not only through their culture and uh, knowledge, but through the method of leadership which is being enjoyed by women in particular. The ability to listen to all parties, the ability to work in a teamwork spirit. These are traits which are very much needed in the business world. So these traits and the characteristics that are enjoyed by women, the ability to listen, the ability to take care of others and to give others are really very important traits. And in fact, transparency is very important and it is very much needed in the business community. Therefore, the Arab women should stand fast. The achievements that have been achieved cannot be given up under any circumstances. We are together in this uh, endeavor. Women are supporting other women, and we shouldn't forget that men uh, are supportive of women. So working as one team would enable women to overcome this uh, crisis. Yes, true. And I think that Mr. Khalid and Mr. Ahmed are uh, the strong supporters of women and women's uh, rights. Uh, Your Royal Highness uh, Atawil, in one minute, what is the message that can be conveyed to Arab women as uh, the director of an institution which is discovering those talents and the skills? I cannot add more than what has been said by Her Excellency the Minister. But in fact, in the Arab region, we do need uh, coordination organizations. There are great efforts in the private market as well as in the public uh, sector and in the civil society, but we don't have this focal point which is coordinating among all these uh, efforts. In fact, uh, uh, we are trying to establish uh, a partnership between the private market and the public market. And in fact, we have supported 25 uh, SMEs um, in the past. We are reaching a huge number of youth in the Arab region. And we have the Kiva initiative. This uh, Kiva is an electronic website for microfinance in order to support men and women um, in the Arab region. We wanted to have a database uh, as well as uh, IT systems that would group all the youth that have initiatives in order to be supporting to those uh, young men and women. And in fact, within one year, Kiva received uh, credits in order to support SMEs. So if we have more of these organizations, we are um, uh, quite sure that uh, we will be uh, successful. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, Your Royal Highness Tawil, Your Excellency Mr. Ahmed and Mr. Khalid. We would like to thank you very much for this uh, debate, uh, which is about women uh, par excellence. Thank you very much. Uh, for the audience for following up this debate from the Dead Sea in Jordan, where we have the WEF meeting for MENA region. I would like to convey my thanks and appreciation to all of you, wherever you are. Thank you very much indeed.
not from the Arab world. Thank you very much. I would like to take a number of questions. And after that, I would like to give the floor to the uh, speakers. In fact, uh, I was surprised because we, we didn't uh, uh, speak about uh, the uh, class C, uh, ceiling as well as the uh, promotion of women. In fact, sometimes women go into the labor market, but they are not promoted. I have seen a number of women, but I haven't seen those women in the uh, senior management. So in fact, the question is, how can the corporations uh, work in order to get the promotion of women into the senior management? There is a question here. English. Um, my name is Emma Dickey. Um, I uh, am the Group General Counsel for Averda, which is a waste management company. And I'm also a lawyer for a top New York law firm, and I'm actually the only female um, working in corporate law for the entire Middle East. And it's 2013, and that's disturbing. So it's not just an, a problem for Arabic women, but women globally. Um, a couple of years ago, and this is a comment, I'd really like your, your views on it. A couple of years ago, um, I uh, was working at a law firm and I had um, an intern and she was uh, an, uh, I live in, in Dubai, she's, a, she's an Emirati girl. And um, she, she was studying law in the UK and, uh, and she, some, somebody came to her school, she went to a, an all-girl all uh, local school and somebody came to her school just before she was about to finish and they presented something on career options. And it wasn't until then that she became aware that she w had the opportunity to go to university or anything like that. And she told me that, and this was sort of in 2011, she told me that her and all of her friends were going to finish school and get married and have babies. And they actually weren't even aware that they had the opportunity to study or go to work or anything else. And uh, she asked her parents if she could go and study and they were very happy for her to do this. So that's how she went on to study law. And I think one of the big issues, of course, it's legislation and, and, and that's, a, that's a massive thing, but it's also awareness um, for women to know that there are amazing opportunities open to them and, um, and supporting women and sort of sharing knowledge. Um, so I'd, I'd like your, your view on how, how we can possibly do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. We are going to take more, uh, two more questions before we answer them. Pat Lancaster, I work for the Middle East magazine. I was very interested in what Mr. Ben Musa had to say about the UAE initiative in, in large companies to employ a certain percentage of women. And I just wanted to ask other members of the panel whether they thought that was a feasible option in Saudi Arabia and Jordan, and indeed other areas of the Middle East. And just to follow on from what the previous speaker said, please don't think that equal pay exists anywhere in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Another question, if you may. My name is Talat El Alawi from Palestine. My question is uh, for Her Royal Highness as well as the Jordanian minister. In many of the civil society organizations as well as the alliances that are working in order to advocate uh, women's rights in the employment market. In fact, we have a problem which is related to that. And uh, there is um, a certain alliance. And I would like to say that in some sectors, we have 37% of women employment. And in other sectors, they are 11%. And in certain sectors, it is 0% of women employment. Uh, even in the open societies in which women can work in all uh, and in various sectors, regardless to the percentage of employment, there are certain sectors that are closed in face of women. And as Arabs, we believe that there are certain sectors, such as the uh, contractual work as well as other sectors, the women employment is 0%. So in fact, in our um, alliance, we have a problem. I would like to ask, what is the percentage through which we can judge that this society has gender equality with regard to employment? Is it the percentage of 30% or 20%? Uh, 
because uh, if uh, we are aspiring for achieving 50% of women employment cannot be achieved vis-a-vis uh, -vis some of the um, problems that I've mentioned. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a question by the lady. My name is Nina Curley, so I'm going to ask in English. I work as the editor-in-chief at WAMDA, um, which is an online portal for entrepreneurship news. And I've also recently launched a WAMDA for Women roundtable series, where we're bringing women together, female entrepreneurs and businesswomen throughout the region to discuss their challenges in a very frank manner. And so my question is for Princess Amira and possibly Mr. Ben Musa, although it applies to all of you. Um, can you speak to the more psychological side of the challenges that women face when you know they might be holding back from pursuing leadership <laughs> positions? And you know, when it comes to the initiatives that Coca-Cola has started, do you offer sort of that psychological training or support to encourage women to actually step up and pursue leadership positions? Thank you. Shukran, shukran Thank you very much indeed. So we have a number of questions uh, that have uh, uh, addressed to Her Royal Highness and the Jordanian minister. There are cultures that are deeply rooted in the societies. Do you think that the legislations and the laws can overcome such uh, cultures or not? Uh, there is also another question which is related to the sectors that are uh, monopolized by men rather than by women. The Jordanian minister, thank you very much uh, indeed for the questions. With regard to overcoming the traditions and the customs, I'm quite sure that the legislations and the laws cannot be the only tool through which we can change the culture. But laws and legislations can change the situation in a way that would lead to overcoming those obstacles. With regard to the fact that the culture is governing us, no, the laws are. Uh, regardless to the respect and enforcement of law, we are looking forward to the rule of law and the state of institutions. But uh, unless the legislations and the laws are pushing cert uh, toward a certain uh, goal, we won't be able to succeed. But I think that customs and traditions can be overcome. And in my um, uh, talk, I spoken about giving up uh, the right to the inheritance by women. This is one of the customs and traditions. But in fact, laws can help us achieve our success. And this has been stipulated in the Holy Quran. Therefore, we have to have uh, legislations, and this can be achieved in partnership with other institutions so that we have creative solutions that would uh, fulfill the needs of women. The uh, government and the legislators alone cannot uh, put the appropriate mechanism, but through other interventions uh, from the civil society organizations as well as the feminist uh, movements, we can have creative solutions that would fulfill the needs of women in a better way. With regard to the topic uh, or the question about the um, best uh, percentage or the appropriate uh, percentage of women employment, which was raised by the Palestinian colleague, I believe that what is more important is the critical mass. So the uh, 30 to 33 percent in any parliament, uh, if uh, is given to women, this is a critical mass that can cause change. But in the employment market, I think that it is different. It is for sure that uh, it is important to have the quota or the affirmative action in order to make sure that uh, women uh, can reach the uh, senior management. But uh, with regard to other issues which, is, uh, which are related to the um, employment, we are talking about uh, rights uh, and individual and the collective uh, rights. I think that for women, they should have their own choices. They should be able to choose what suits them. And in fact, uh, getting to the labor market doesn't mean that there is a contradiction with playing its role as a mother. But in this regard, we have to talk about uh, different aspects. Women as citizens have their own rights and they have duties. So the question is, how can we empower them in order to enjoy their rights? Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. I have only five minutes uh, before concluding uh, this debate. Uh, Your Royal Highness, do you have any comments uh, on the questions that were raised? I'll answer your question in English. 
but you asked about the psychological side, which is very important. Um, unfortunately, we find in our region something that exists everywhere but does not exist as much uh, with us is the circles of women supporting each other. Of course, you will have um, um, criticisms from the society. I've had it. You'll have it from people who are close to you, from people in your environment, at your working environment, at your home. Everywhere you go, you hear criticisms. If you don't have a circle of people who are living through this with you, if you don't believe in what you're doing, you will not make it. You will not continue working, and you will not continue uh, facing uh, those criticism with, you know, uh, high self-esteem, knowing that you've you've done what you are what you believe in. Now, the good thing about it is that I work with a couple of other women. We establish a network of women leaders. Also, the Chamber of Commerce is an amazing network of women leaders in Saudi society. So I have circles of leading women that I see and I'm inspired by. Unfortunately, we don't celebrate success stories in the region. We have amazing women who accomplished many things in the public sector, in the private sector. In Saudi alone, we have Lubna, uh, Dr. Lubna Al-Ayan, who is an amazing businesswoman, one of the top in the region. And those are the role models to set for a young woman talking about breaking the glass ceiling, is that when you see someone who was able to make it with all of the difficulties surrounding them, that inspires you to achieve more, to reach your goal. And so we have to celebrate success, we have to be inspired, and we have to surround ourselves with women who are going through the same circumstances we are going through. Thank you very much, Sayyid Ahmed bin Musa. There are questions that are related to the position of women after entering into the labor market. There are questions that are related to the position of women after entering into the labor market and inside corporations. For asking the question, I think it's, it's critical that we understand that there is a business case for empowering women inside the organization, that everybody will benefit. Um, and I think the, the point that uh, Samul Amira mentioned regarding the networking, I think is so important. Mm -hmm. I think organizations have to enable women to have peer networking opportunities, where uh, in the case of Coca-Cola, not only we, we bring at least twice a year women leaders together, and in fact, over the last three years, we've had three major events in Dubai specifically, but we also in, invite our friends from government and from uh, public sector to come and inspire these women. Uh, and, and friends coming from the Middle East, but also from outside the Middle East. I think that, that is the most powerful thing. And I think as leaders, we have to demonstrate that. We have to walk the talk and build the business case always so that those psychological barriers are, are, are basically uh, broken and that we can go through it. I think it's important that we, uh, leaders of organization, be it in the public or the private sector, have to showcase why it makes sense. And I've, said, I've shared with you some of the statistics. I think we, as in Coca-Cola, believe that this is the only way forward. There is, we don't have other alternatives that empowering women and making them part of the, uh, around the same table where all the decisions are made. Thank you very much, Mr. Musa. So, Mr. Khalid Al Khudir, you will have the concluding remarks. So, do you have any comments on these interventions? The, uh, speaking about the glass ceiling part, and in the kingdom right now, it's current, we're currently studying allowing women to work uh, as CEOs in stock listed uh, companies in the kingdom. And, and this in itself, uh, the leadership and, 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 uh, of, of the kingdom sees that things have to work from top to bottom. And having women as success stories, such as uh, Her Highness Princess Amira, um, actually um, adds a lot of value to women that are, that are currently in university and studying and about to graduate, because they don't know what, what's up against them, what's ahead. And so success stories, as uh, Her Highness uh, mentioned, is the key factor for us in the Arab world. And I hope that um, through uh, media channels such as France 24, we're able to uh, share these success stories and also change perception about the kingdom when it comes to uh, women, uh, Saudi women, and what the, the labor market and uh, the kingdom is doing uh, to affect women in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Shukran lak, idhan, Sayyid Khalid. Thank you very much, Mr. Khalid Al Khudir, Your Excellency, the Jordanian Minister, Your Royal Highness Amira, and Mr. Ahmed. Thank you very much for all the panelists and for the, for the people present with us and for taking part in this debate. Thank you very much, and I'm quite sure that uh, the exchange of ideas would continue outside this.
call and through this conference and even uh, the way ahead. Thank you very much indeed.